Welcome everybody to the first in this series of webinars that we are running as a result of uh, the IPAN initiated people's inquiry into the costs and consequences of Australia's involvement in US led wars and the alliance with the United States and looking for out of the inquiry for people to put forward alternatives for a way forward out of this um, current foreign policy situation that we are in. I'd like to first um, acknowledge that we're all meeting on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands. That is because that land has never been ceded and we look forward to a time when that process has been enacted and that is fully recognised in this country. Um, I'd like to first start by just a brief rundown on where we're at with the inquiry. For though many of you may have been at the launch of the inquiry in November last year, and uh, since that time, we have been open for submissions and the submissions are coming in. We've had some really interesting um, viewpoints um, sent through to the inquiry uh, and we need more. So this inquiry will have credibility if we have a good cross section and a good number of people sending in their inquiry in, in, in their submissions. So as you may or may not know, we've identified eight distinct areas where there are impacts of these wars that we've engaged in and the alliance with the United States. And those areas are the impact on first peoples of this country, on unions and workers' rights, on the environment, on military and defence, on foreign policy, on social and community, economic repercussions, and political and democratic rights that have been impacted by the close relationship with the United States and the wars that we've engaged in. So for each of those areas, we've been very fortunate to have a respected leader in the community come forth to lead each of those areas and to receive submissions that pertain to those particular areas. So um, the process will be that after those, uh, the cutoff point for submissions, which is the 31st of July, but really we want you to get those, that writing happening now and to get those submissions coming in as soon as possible. If nothing else, but to make it easier for the panel leaders to uh, process those submissions uh, in the in the in the in the um, process of writing their reports. So tonight we are very fortunate to have with us two of those uh, community leaders. We have Professor Ian Lowe, uh, who many of you will know. Um, I've been working with Ian over the years on environmental issues, but also anti-nuclear issues for a very long time, and uh, he's he's been a, a pleasure to work with. Uh, so Ian, if you don't know, is an Emeritus Professor of Science, Technology and Society at Griffith University and he chaired the Advisory Council that produced the first independent national report on the state of the environment in 1996. That's a long time ago, Ian. <laughs> uh, he has also been uh, the President of the ACF for many, for not quite a number of years. So. Welcome, Ian. <laughs> and um, so Ian is going to be first up to speak, uh, followed by Peter Catt. And again, we are very grateful to Peter for coming on board with this inquiry. He's well known amongst um, us uh, in the activism and progressive circles in Brisbane uh, as, uh, you know, someone who supports human rights, peace, the rights of refugees, and much, much more. Peter is the, the Dean of St. John's Cathedral in the centre of Brisbane. And I've been very honoured to work with Peter over the last 10 years, uh, running the International Day of Peace lecture. And we've had some amazing people deliver that lecture on the 21st of September each year. So I'm going to hand over now to, um, to Ian, but just before I do, just etiquette, please make sure you remain uh, muted until we get to the Q&A. Uh, part of the evening. Ian will talk for about 15 minutes, Peter similarly, and then we'll be open for questions which we'd really like you to put through the chat um, line and um, 
we have someone monitoring that chat line and is going to send those um, questions through to the speakers. Um, but we, we will also be open to having people that, um, ask those questions themselves at the time. All right, Ian, it's all yours. I unmute myself and yes. share the screen. Ian's got a, a number of slides to speak to. Thanks. Are you seeing the slides? Are we That's right? No, we're not seeing them yet, Ian. Ah. Let me minimise that. Um, go back to um, share the screen. Work for <laughs> oh dear. Um, PowerPoint. I'm beginning. See them now. Yep. See them now. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about environmental impacts of warfare. Uh, I'm going to spell out the general problem, give some specific examples from American wars that we have mindlessly supported in my lifetime, and um, then talk about uh, two big issues that are ticking away in the background. First, the general issue. The then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said to a conference in 2014, the environment has long been a silent casualty of war and armed conflict. From the contamination of land, and the destruction of forests, the plunder of natural resources and the collapse of management systems, the environmental consequences of war are often widespread and devastating. More recently, an article in The Guardian said, uh, explaining how this happens, war changes our parameters. In the face of actual or perceived threat, acts that would normally be abhorrent become acceptable and even routine. One of the first of our sensibilities to be discarded in warfare is the protection of the environment, says Catherine Lutz, a professor on war and its impacts at the Watson Institute for International Studies. Let me give you three examples of direct impacts from American wars that we've been involved in. First, Afghanistan. The cost of war project says illegal logging by US-backed warlords and wood harvesting by refugees caused more than one third of Afghanistan's forests to vanish between 1990 and 2007. Drought, desertification and species loss have resulted. The number of migratory birds passing through Afghanistan has fallen by 85%. And the permanent image I have uh, from every TV report on the war in Afghanistan is never seeing a tree, never seeing a blade of grass, simply seeing sand and bare rock, uh, basically because of the devastation that has followed during the war which we have mindlessly participated in. Secondly, Iraq. During the first Gulf War, the US bombed Iraq with 340 tonnes of missiles containing depleted uranium. And of course, radiation is a direct cancer threat uh, to humans and it's not good for animals as well. More generally, infrastructure damage led to pollution of water and air, sewage flowing into rivers, etc. Hundreds of oil wells were set on fire. Um, in this war, which we were led into by John Howard repeating the George W. Bush lie that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Of course, the, the reason that the coalition of the willing was able to steamroll Saddam Hussein's army was that he didn't have weapons of mass destruction. It was simply a barefaced lie. But we participated in this environmental destruction that uh, was an inevitable consequence of that war. Uh, thirdly, Vietnam. Uh, I recently visited Vietnam and I discovered that what we call the Vietnam War is known there as the American War to differentiate it from the French War. Uh, in which uh, the Vietnamese people uh, fought off the colonial power and thought they had achieved independence until the United States of America decided that they didn't like who was likely to be in charge of 
an independent Vietnam and decided to start a civil war. And uh, we mindlessly followed suit, uh, being told by our then leaders that there was a domino theory that um, if Vietnam had a communist government, then communism would inevitably roll like a red tide south and engulf Australia, a uh, sort of gravitational theory of politics, which uh, has uh, no obvious logic to it. Deforestation was widely practiced to try to interrupt the supply lines of Vietnamese fighters. And uh, one environmental professor said recently, Many of the trees in the tropical mangrove forests near the southernmost coast of South Vietnam were killed by a single spraying. It's estimated it will take up to a century for the mangrove forest to recover without reseeding. Since these and adjacent waters served as breeding and nursery grounds for wildlife, the area's entire ecology was catastrophically affected. And uh, those problems remain to this day. And uh, the use of Agent Orange was pretty bad for the humans who were there as well as for the environment. Their specific environmental issues that have resulted from American wars in which we participated. I now want to mention the two big issues which are ticking away in the background. The first is climate change. Uh, this graph of global mean temperature shows uh, a trend that should be obvious to anyone who can read joined up writing and do take away sums, uh, but has escaped the attention of some of our members of parliament. Uh, there is a clear trend, not just of increasing temperature, but of temperature increasing at an increasing rate. The Australian Academy of Science uh, summed up the situation nearly a decade ago when they looked at the past record of fossil fuel combustion and release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and the record of warming and two alternative futures. The blue line is an optimistic future in which as a global community we get our act together, uh, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions peak in the next decade and then go steeply down so that we've decarbonized energy supply by the middle of this century. And the blue spread of curves shows the scientifically credible range of estimates of what that will mean in terms of increasing average global temperature. The, the good news is that there is, it is still scientifically credible that we could keep the increase in average global temperature below two degrees, but it would require concerted action starting yesterday. The red curve is the business as usual trajectory of increasing quantities of greenhouse gases being released into the atmosphere, uh, driven by people suggesting, for example, that uh, the recovery from COVID requires burning increasing amounts of gas, uh, or even in some of the more deranged corners of parliament, public subsidies of new coal-fired power stations. The red curve shows what would be the carbon dioxide trajectory if there wasn't concerted action. And the, on the bottom graph, that spread shows the scientifically credible range of estimates of what that would mean in terms of average global temperature. And basically what it says is at the moment, we're on course for three or four degrees increase in average global temperature. And that's average. Uh, I remind you that the average global temperature has now increased by about one degree but the average temperature in places like central Australia is increased by two and a half degrees because of the old primary school geography maxim that climate is determined by latitude, altitude, and nearness to the sea. Basically, as you get further inland, the climate is not moderated by the ocean. It's colder in winter and hotter in summer. So basically, we are on track for a catastrophic future. How does the military contribute to this? Well, the point is that uh, the military is a very large consumer of fossil fuels. A recent article in The Guardian pointed out that the US Department of Defense is the country's largest consumer of fossil fuels. 2007, nearly 15 years ago, the, the military used 20 billion liters of fuel each year. So the US military alone releases similar amounts of carbon dioxide to a mid-sized European country such as Denmark. 
And that's before they go to war, as the Guardian said. The carbon footprint of the deployed modern army is typically enormous. One report suggested the US military was using nearly 200 million litres of oil every month during the invasion of Iraq. And it's used very wastefully. It's estimated that two thirds of the fuel was used to deliver fuel to the vehicles at the battlefront rather than to do anything useful like murdering people. So uh, as well as having direct environmental impacts like deforestation, pollution of air and water, the military is a very significant contributor to the problem of worsening climate change. The other big issue is nuclear weapons. The world uh, has made some progress, uh, but there's still an estimated arsenal of over 13,000 nuclear weapons, of which more than 3,000 are primed ready for use. Using only a few would render entire regions uninhabitable. 50 nations have now endorsed a UN treaty saying that nuclear weapons should be eliminated. Australia, to our shame, has not signed that UN treaty. And uh, it's sometimes argued that uh, we don't sign it because we implicitly rely on the nuclear weapons of the United States of America to defend it. Let me just make a point about the morality of defence based on nuclear weapons. When a deranged individual holds a small group of people hostage, and threatens to murder them unless their wishes are granted, we are rightly horrified. And our police forces respond with all of the force they can assemble to silence this obviously unacceptable threat to a small number of innocent civilians. A defence policy based on nuclear weapon is essentially saying we will murder millions of innocent civilians if our wishes are not granted. And that is clearly morally indefensible on a, a huge scale. So the final point, uh, warfare has disastrous local small scale environmental impacts. Uh, there are too many recent examples to document. I simply picked three from three recent US wars in which Australia has been involved and in each of those cases, I could have given more examples of the environmental damage that resulted from the warfare. As well as those local environmental impacts of warfare, the military is involved in the two existential threats to human civilization. Military use of fossil fuels is a significant contributor to climate change. And we have the continuing threat of nuclear weapons, a small fraction of the arsenal of which would render entire regions uninhabitable. The conclusion is that uh, the military is a very significant environmental threat and a world in which we disarmed, a world in which there was less warfare, a world in which nuclear weapons were not deployed, and in which the military was not charging around burning huge amounts of fossil fuels would be better for the environment as well as better for human civilization. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, you can stop sharing now. That, that's great. That was. Yeah, a good sort of summing up in 15 minutes of just where we're at. I think what uh, my, one of my questions to you will be, what are the impacts of the uh, training and preparation for war on the Australian landscape? And I'm thinking particularly about the talisman sabre exercises that happen every two years on the Barrier Reef and on central Queensland. But um, you, can, you can save that one up, Ian, for when we get to Q&A. <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, now we've got Peter Cat here to um, to talk to us about the social and community impacts of um, engagement in wars and war preparedness, a militaristic culture. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, well, I'm no expert in wars, and I'm certainly no expert in American wars. So. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, inquiry because I am really interested in how uh, we develop a self-understanding as a nation. And um, 
and certainly in terms of my interest with refugees, um, I can see the effect of uh, the wars in which we have participated. Um, I did say to the organisers at the beginning that, um, that sometimes I thought we were letting ourselves off the hook by calling these American wars, whereas I think Ian quite rightly referred to the coalition of the willing when it came to the Iraq war, and that was Tony Blair, John Howard, and George Bush working in concert, and Australia was uh, not only complicit, but a leader in producing that coalition of the willing. So it was it was an American war, but we were we were up the front in the we were riding shotgun in the <laughs> going go yes that's right, and you know that that war just to use that war as an example that war had, there are still two million people displaced from that war. And many of those people tried to get to safety to come to a place like Australia. And so what did we do? We decided that we wouldn't admit them. We did the same with the Afghan, we, another war that we were willing participants in, and we're still there uh, in many ways. But there are still 2.7 million people dislocated by the Afghan war. Again, people who tried to get to Australia and we repelled them. One of the social impacts, as I see it, is that uh, because of the way we responded to those people trying to come to Australia, we actually developed a really ugly persona. It started with the Tampa, where we, you know, that, that incredible statement that has been repeated even by our most recent prime minister, but all prime ministers since John Howard, you know, we will decide who comes to this country and on what terms, without any sense of sort of moral connection to the people who'd been displaced by the wars of which we're, we're a part. And so one of the things that interests me is how things like that then actually feed into the national psyche. So we can see the cause and effect of how those people, dislocated people, caused uh, uh, some pressure on uh, arrivals in Australia. And then we responded by wanting to turn back the boats and keep them out. And what we saw at play in Australia was that, that by being involved in those wars, we actually saw playing out in, a, in our own in our own country was um, divisive politics. We actually started down the track that America has perfected with Trump of actually um, characterizing each other as enemy. We actually started to label each other as enemy. And so one of the things I'm hoping we will be able to explore through the through the uh, inquiry is how those sort of things affect our sense of who we are. I'm really um, proud of the fact that some of the work that the churches did uh, with refugees actually did begin to turn public perception back towards being sympathetic to refugees and did begin to overcome some of that divisiveness. But we do have that tendency in this nation for the, the uh, underbelly of uh, you know, the darker angels of our nature, if you, have, if you like, to come out and play. And by being involved in the destabilization of whole re regions, we are actually uh, bringing that destabilization home to roost. And I think that's one of the things that we need to become acutely aware of is that uh, I think sometimes our political masters, not only in Australia, but in other places, think that if you fight the war offshore somewhere, you, you may, the war never comes home. And yet we know from in Vietnam, the war came home. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the war has come home, not just in terms of the physical return of our service people who come home damaged and bring that damage to, to the to to Australia, but we actually bring the, the uh, destabilization that is, is manifest in other parts of the world, it eventually comes home and we destabilize ourselves. And so I'm really interested in exploring how 
our national narrative has been shaped by these wars. There are, of course, some um, sort of direct shaping of the war, of the narrative and you know, living in Brisbane, we see bits and pieces of it everywhere. We've got MacArthur chambers and we've got um, old uh, bomb shelters and stuff like that. And we can still see that sense of the dependence we developed on America and the, um, if you like, almost, uh, it's almost like a cargo cult developed around America in the Pacific. And we still see that playing out today. In, in some of the um, interactions between Australia, the US and China. And that's affecting, that affects the way we understand ourselves and affects the way um, we understand, whether we understand ourselves to be truly at home in this region or whether we're actually, uh, we're, we're still wishing to be somewhere else. And so for me, it's, um, there's a lot to be unpacked in terms of how our involvement in other places has shaped the way we actually behave at home. As well as the stuff we physically import, there's also the way it affects uh, our narrative. And, um, so that's where my interest lies. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, I'd just like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome, um, I believe Kelly Tranter is, uh, has joined the webinar and um, Kelly, if you would like to wave your hand and say hello, that would be great. All right, now in terms of questions, um, I'm going to start off really with that question to Ian. Have you given it some thought, Ian, about the effects on the Australian environment and Indigenous lands, really, um, of the military training exercises that we have in this country? Well, we um, really ride roughshod over the, the wishes of the original Australians by allowing the American military to organise war games on uh, their land. And um, we, um, it's not widely known that the um, the military are actually a very significant land holder in Australia. They uh, uh, possess large quantities of uh, rural Australian land, uh, many of which are used for these sorts of exercises like Talisman and Sabre, um, which, let's be honest, are really preparing to fight wars. Uh, they're not uh, in any sense preparation to defend us. Um, uh, and it's not obvious that we have any enemies against from which we need to be defended anyway. Uh, but um, there, there is sometimes political discussion about why we're having these exercises, but I have never seen any analysis in public of the environmental consequences, not just the contribution to climate change of huge numbers of military vehicles roaring around, but the impact on the coastal area, the impact on the waterways, the Barrier Reef Lagoon, uh, and the impact on land of um, the military practicing uh, how to uh, kill innocent people in other countries. So um, we really should recognize that there are environmental consequences of having these sorts of exercises. And uh, that should be one of the reasons for saying that they shouldn't go ahead. Yep, absolutely. Would anyone like to ask a question? Uh, just put your hand I wonder, up. I wonder if I could ask Peter a question. Okay, you go for that and then we've got a question after you do that. Peter, one of the things that interests me is that successive coalition governments under Menzies and then Holt and then Gordon and then McMahon um, encouraged Australian involvement in the American war in Vietnam and encouraged Vietnamese people to join in. And uh, when the war ended, we recognised, uh, the coalition government under Malcolm Fraser recognised that they had some moral obligation to accept the boatloads of Vietnamese who were fleeing the country, basically because they had been encouraged by us to join in the losing side of that war. 
mm. uh, and they arrived by boat in many cases. Um, and we even changed what had historically been uh, a an explicitly anti-Asian immigration policy mm -hmm. to accept the refugees from Vietnam. Mm. What do you think happened between 1980 and 2000 that allowed the coalition governments under Howard and ministers like Morrison to demonise yep. people who were in just the same way as the Vietnamese in the late 1970s, fleeing the consequences of wars in which we were involved in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's one that we've reflected on quite a lot. Um, because, you know, in, seven, in the 70s, um, not only did we accept the boat people, we actually then uh, implemented uh, orderly departure schemes where people could leave, could stay home and, and flee. Um, and the Refugee Task Force, the Church's Refugee Task Force here has been advocating for the government to establish that same sort of uh, process through uh, things like the Bali process for people uh, who want to flee now. But I think, I think what changed was that um, was that um, John Howard saw an opportunity to simply score a political win. Uh, whereas um, Fraser, um, for all of his other complexities, uh, was driven by a humanitarian and ethical argument about these people served us um, and we have to keep them safe, we have to stop them. So, so he wanted to stop the boats by rescuing the people who wanted to get onto the boats. Uh, I just, I think John Howard could see the opportunity to win an election. And that's tends to be what happens um, with many of the uh, emotional push button type uh, issues, uh, like law and order is another one. So for, for years in Victoria, there was a bipartisan acceptance that they wouldn't beat the law and order drum because law um, dealing with uh, crime was actually a very complex matter. And so they had, they had nearly 20 years of developing the best uh, criminal justice system and dealing with people in ways that actually stopped re recidivism. And then um, that turned on a dime when one of the political parties saw the opportunity to score political points because they were in fear of losing an election. And I think in 2000, that's what happened is that we, um, is that it just turned on a dime and there was an opportunity there and there's been many opportunities since for there to be a bipartisan approach, which was humanitarian but what we've ended up with is a, human, a bipartisan approach, which is torturous. And both, both parties have uh, fed that. You know, I, I constantly remind people it was a Labor government that, invent, that introduced mandatory detention. And we have, you know, we have people at Kangaroo Point, not far from where I am now, um, going crazy in hotels. This, They've been locked up for years. Mm, disgusting. Okay, uh, we do have a question from John Hallam, and uh, then there's a couple of other questions to follow. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure whether this quest qualifies as a, as a question or as a comment, but I certainly do hope um, that there is a response from both of you. Um, dot point number one, um, this is all about nuclear weapons. Um, I spend my entire life dealing with nuclear weapons. So um, dot point number one, um, I don't know whether you have gone over the research done by Toon, Roebuck and Company um, since 2007 into nuclear winter, you might call it nuclear winter revisited, nuclear winter redone, whatever. Um, but I strongly recommend that you do do so. Um, it is likely that a major nuclear exchange would indeed render the entire planet basically uninhabitable. Um, and the 
the survival of civilization and possibly as, of humans as a species would be in question. So that's what's at stake. Dot point number two, um, the doomsday clock, which is a sort of a rough measure of how likely we are to actually incinerate ourselves, um, is now at 100 seconds to midnight. It has never been closer. And its position was reaffirmed by the Nobel heavy um, board of the doomsday clock um, on the 27th of January, just gone. Um, so we're in greater danger of that actually happening than we've ever been. Dot point number three, um, the ways out of this are at least twofold, not just onefold. Um, in other words, we have the abolition way out, which involves the ban treaty, but also involves um, a number of other things as well, not only the ban treaty, but we also have immediate term risk reduction measures, which is a swathe of fairly unsexy things from no first use to de-alerting, to improve military to military communication, um, to improved nuclear command and control structures, such as there needing to be more than one person to decide whether or not to incinerate the entire planet within a six minute time frame. Um, as is currently the case with the United States. And all of these things are currently extremely live issues. Not only the ban treaty, important as that is, but the whole gamut of risk reduction issues, which I argue are absolutely of life and death importance just as much as is the nuclear ban treaty. Now, I do hope to make a detailed submission on all of that. And I do hope that you'll have some responses to what I've just said. Well, to what Tony Jones would say, I'll take that as a comment, but uh, I will respond with a comment. Um, I'm, uh, I actually got onto um, ABC television and SBS and various radio programs to talk about the doomsday clock and the significance of it staying at 100 seconds to midnight uh, uh, this year, um, and uh, tried to use that uh, to remind people of the threat uh, to civilization that nuclear weapons poses. And you're right. I mean, 50 years ago, we negotiated the non-proliferation treaty, and the argument was that the then five nuclear weapon states would systematically disarm and in return, the other nations of the world would not acquire nuclear weapons. And of course, the nuclear weapon states did not disarm. And as a result, uh, other nations have acquired nuclear weapons using peaceful nuclear technology, starting with India, then Pakistan, uh, Israel, most recently North Korea. And the the sad lesson to every tin pot dictator in the third world of the fact that Saddam Hussein was overthrown in a few weeks because he didn't have weapons of mass destruction, whereas people are tiptoeing very carefully around Kim Jong-un because he might have nuclear weapons. The lesson that gives to every tin pot dictator in the developing world is if you don't want to get pushed around by the big kids, you really should have nuclear weapons. And the obvious point is the more nations have nuclear weapons, the more likely it becomes that sooner or later, a leader will be deranged enough or desperate enough to use them. And it would only take a relatively small number of nuclear weapons to be detonated to render uh, whole areas of the earth uninhabitable. And a major exchange would, as you say, precipitate a nuclear winter. It um, would destroy human civilization and if the human species survive it would be as small bands of warriors foraging for what food supplies remained uh, to keep them alive until it became possible again to grow food uh, a really really grim uh, forecast so i hope you will make a submission along those lines and uh, i hope that uh, this review will remind people of uh, how precarious uh, is our civilization 
while ever there are thousands of nuclear weapons and while ever the obvious lesson to every tin pot there is that if you don't want to be pushed around you should have nuclear weapons mm, thanks ian um peter did you want to add anything there okay i'm going to go to kelly and Kelly, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, Kelly is the overall chair of the inquiry. We're very, very um, uh, appreciative of uh, Kelly accepting that position uh, to chair the inquiry. But um, I'd like you to ask the questions yourself and uh, to make whatever comment that, that you feel you'd like to. Uh, thanks, Annette, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for, for giving up your valuable time to be with us this evening. Uh, thank you to Reverend Cat and Ian Lowe for your informative presentations. I suppose um, my question is directed at, at you, Ian, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, I we're increasingly hearing um, militaries all around the world uh, and defence here specifically refer to climate change as being a security risk. I think Boris Johnson recently indicated to the UN conference that it's, um, it is a security risk. But I was hoping someone with your expertise could actually break that down um, in terms of what that means from the point of view of of warming, so at two degrees or three degrees or four degrees, what can we expect playing out on the ground, which would warrant defence indicating that it's, it's a security risk? Well, one obvious consequence of warming will be increasing difficulty to provide food, to grow crops, to, to keep animals, uh, to produce food. And um, not just produce food, but also distribute food, because the in, basically, I mean, some somebody said that our food is congealed oil. That uh, huge amounts of petroleum fuels are used to plough fields, to sow crops, to harvest crops, to process the food, and to distribute it. And uh, the entire system that allows us to have food on the table is critically dependent on using huge amounts of fossil fuel energy. And um, while some progressive governments have programs in place to decarbonise our electricity supply, uh, which accounts for about a third of our carbon dioxide emissions in Australia, uh, neither our government nor most governments have uh, anything in place to clean up the transport system or, or the agricultural system for producing and distributing food. Uh, so. Uh, decarbonising will involve radical changes to the way we produce and distribute food, as well as, at the same time as climate change is having a significant impact on our ability to produce food in the first place. Um, historically, most wars have been fought over resources. And um, you know, typically, when people ran out of resources, they would send the young men off to, to fight. And um, if they were successful, you would have more resources. And if they were unsuccessful, you'd have fewer mouths to feed. So it was sort of win-win for the politicians to send the young men off to fight. Um, the problem we have today is that um, the increasing power of weapons means that uh, using the military as a way of resolving disputes between countries has become increasingly untenable because of the... the potentially catastrophic consequences uh, of a war. In terms of uh, other security risks, and one of the points that the CIA has been making to American governments for some time is that um, uh, entire coastal communities and borders are being influenced by climate change. And uh, uh, the, um, uh, you, the ability of countries to uh, manage their own affairs is being influenced by the fact that um, sea levels are increasing, uh, coastal storms are becoming more frequent and more severe. Um, at the moment, uh, the state of Texas has been uh, brought to a, a, a shivering halt by uh, a cold snap, which is a direct consequence of destabilisation of the uh, circumpolar current, which uh, historically has kept the very cold air near the pole. So um, there are huge issues uh, in terms of community stability uh, that have resulted already from 
1.2 degrees increase in global temperature. And the most optimistic view is if, with concerted action, we could keep the increase below two degrees. But the Paris Agreement does not do enough to keep it below two degrees. And most nations, including Australia, are not meeting their Paris commitments. Um, so at the moment, we're on track for, as I said, for three or four degrees with catastrophic implications for our ability to keep the community secure, as well as to do basic things like provide food and uh, to keep people safe where they live. Can I add to that, please? Just in terms of the, you know, in terms of uh, climate change causing becoming a security risk, we need to add to that the layer of refugees. Like it's widely widely believed that the Syrian civil war is actually our first uh, climate war because uh, climate change affected the uh, climate in Syria. Many people moved across the country into the cities to stabilise the cities. We ended up with a war that has displaced 20 million people. So, you know, I was talking about two, 2 million for Iraq and 2.7 for Afghanistan. There's 20 million displaced by climate change in Syria. And we know the effect that that's had on the region. So it's, it's added to the instability of the region. And we, if that gets multiplied, like, you know, there's a billion people in the you know, Indochina area dependent on um, glacial melt. If, if those a billion people suddenly become refugees, this is one of the reasons why I've actually shifted my focus to climate advocacy rather than refugee advocacy these days, because I can see that if we don't fix the climate stuff up, we're going to have far more refugees um, walking the face of the planet. So, um, and you know, every time you have those huge waves of people wandering the face of the earth, it destabilizes um, the areas in which they arrive, you know, which we saw you know, happen in Europe when that mass migration of people happened uh, a couple of years ago. And that then becomes a security threat. So you've got security threat just by people who are wandering around uh, as well. And that's a direct, direct result of climate change. If I could add a point to that, Peter, um, the people have been saying for years that we're likely to see wars fought over water because the major rivers of Southeast Asia, like the Mekong, flow through several countries. And an obvious consequence of reducing flow is for each country to try and build reservoirs so that they get a greater share of the water. And uh, we are likely to see warfare happen as a result of uh, our inability to play nicely and share what limited resources are available. I've got a question here for Peter from Chris Hawke. He says, how do we engage people to actually allow themselves to actually engage publicly with the complexities of these issues and regarding their safety? Fear emotionally immobilizes most people from even engaging publicly. The psychological operations perspective seems to be winning the public publicly relations war. Great question. Thanks, Chris. Um, so certainly our experience is, is that people are persuaded by um, careful use of language. So, you know, in the refugee sector, we've been using a thing for quite a few years now called uh, words that work. So you actually use, word, you actually have to think about how the words that you use. And the second thing is that we need to personalise the plight. So when we had the ref, uh, when we had the uh, the sanctuary movement going with churches in Australia, the thing that drove that was we actually had the names and the images and the stories of the children, and that's what mobilised people. And at the hospital, Lady Chilento Hospital here, we had a baby called Baby Asher, and hundreds of people came out because we knew her story. And so one of the one of the uh, things we have to do is capture more stories of people, and you know, it's it's what drove that series. You know, go back to where you came from, when people actually engaged with real people and real stories, they were persuaded. And 
we just have to do the hard work, I think. It's, it's, a, it's about personalising um, rather than ideology. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I've got a thing to sort of bring up, I suppose, along the lines of national identity, which you spoke about in your, your presentation. Um, you know, looking at the history of Australia since Federation, we had uh, at the very beginning of the 1900s a very strong sense of identity and who we were that wasn't based on war. And yet, you know, we, we saw a very strong sort of social uh, egalitarian movement that's been talked a lot about the historian uh, Marilyn Lake. She talks about the women's movement, the, the union movement that was so strong in the period leading up to the First World War. And uh, unfortunately, it, it, it all kind of basically fell apart in the aftermath of the First World War. And war then sort of took dominance in terms of uh, whoever was leading our country to create our national identity around the wars that we've engaged in. I'd like to know what, um, you know, how you think that we can start shifting that sense of who we are and we are an evolving uh, community of people. We're very different to 100 years ago. We're very multicultural and multicultural uh, and multinational. Um, and um, how, how do we attack or undermine this sense of identity that's so dependent on our engagement in wars and which, you know, allows us to continue to support those wars? <clears throat> That's a really good question. Um, we do need to remember that that national identity back then was also very white and that the, the first first act of parliament was the white Australia policy. So you know, there is a certain appeal about the national identity, but it was very white and exclusive of our First Nations people. Um, and, but I think that's one of the key key conversation it's a it's a conversation that it's certainly we can see is is having to happen around australia day um you know australia day is broken so what do you replace it with and i think i think one of the things that would help us reclaim some sense of identity is to find find a new national day to have a conversation about what that looks like at the moment our de facto national day i think is actually anzac day and that then feeds into the whole war thing because um, you know the, the myth, the myth, the Anzac myth is that on the battlefields of Gallipoli we became a nation. So I mean, one of the so one of the challenges is is to have um, a lot more dialogue about when are we going to celebrate our national day. We can't do it on the twenty sixth of uh, January. That day is broken by the and it's, we can tell it's broken by the fact that it's always conflicted. You're not going to be able to, no one is going to be able to put that back into the box. You can't get that genie back into that box. But the only other day we've got in common is Anzac Day. So you know, um, what, what, what day are we going, what, what are we going to actually celebrate that gives, the, that talks about our national character? Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but we actually need to start having that conversation. Because once we have that conversation and find a time when we can actually say we are celebrating being Australian, then we can actually start to separate ourselves from our de facto national day, which is Anzac Day, which is all about war. Ian, would you like to make comment on that? Uh, the only comment I'd make is that uh, things have changed significantly in my lifetime. When I was young, the Anzac Day March was a big thing in a country town because a large fraction of the adult males had been involved in World War II. And in World War II, we perceived there was an existential threat to the survival of Australia. And so there was universal agreement that people needed to fight to defend Australia. Uh, since then, there has not been any war involved in where there was any agreement that there was a threat to Australia. And um, it was really going back to what Peter said about political opportunism. It was uh, political opportunism to try and rehabilitate Anzac Day and uh, make it more of a, a national celebration. But um, the wars that Australia has been involved in in recent years have been our professional military being sent off to support an American action in Afghanistan or in Iraq or wherever. And um, there's no 
community support. In fact, there was huge community opposition to our involvement in the Iraq war, which uh, John Howard just ignored. The biggest demonstrations ever in Brisbane. Uh, uh, I got off the train at Roma Street Station and I couldn't get within 200 yards of uh, the demonstration because there were so many people in the street. It was the biggest demonstrations we've ever seen. So I think the community doesn't support that sort of military adventurism. And Peter's right, what we need to do is find something to celebrate as Australians. I mean, my hope is that we will eventually cease to be part of the, the British Empire, we'll become a republic, and uh, we will joyfully celebrate uh, becoming an independent nation. I mean, I think historians would say that we moved seamlessly from being a British colony to being an American colony without ever being independent. And if we're a republic, we might actually become independent, have our own foreign policy, um, and agree that uh, we don't need to support whatever half-baked adventure the American military think is a good idea at the time. Yes, and uh, at that same time to um, to educate and to recognise so uh, that we are newcomers to this land, just a couple of hundred years, really. Yeah. We're getting close to the end, but I would like to see if anyone else would like to put their hand up to make a comment or um, ask a question. Anyone there like to have their say at this stage? <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, I, I think it's been a really valuable discussion and I would like to re-emphasise the importance of um, you all um, putting those submissions in. They don't need to be lengthy submissions, they can be 100 words or 5,000 words, whatever you are motivated to share what you are thinking. Um, so this is going to have credibility. It's, that it's the first time that anything like this has been done in Australia and it you, you know, you've got an opportunity to be one of those people that registers your views about where we're at at this point in time in history and to make your recommendations for the future, how we can move towards being a peaceful, peace promoting, a progressive and um, a country that knows its place in the, in the region in which we live and recognises and values all of the cultures that we have encompassed in this country but also which surround us and the peoples that surround us. Um, now we, as I said at the beginning, this is a series of webinars and the next webinar, so put it in your diary, it's the 25th of March and um, Kelly Tranter will be uh, facilitating the next webinar. And uh, we have Dr. Vince Scapatura. He teaches at Macquarie University is an absolute whiz of knowledge about foreign policy and military uh, matters. Uh, and also Dr. Alison Bronowski. Um, Alison's uh, um, teachers at university. She has written extensively on foreign policy and on the United Nations and what needs to happen if we're truly to have an effective United Nations body to help us with these major challenges that we face uh, in internationally. So I welcome you all again to um, join us on the 25th of March. Um, it will be at, um, uh, it'll be an hour earlier. That's the only difference uh, between the dates, an hour earlier. Kelly, did you want to say anything to sum up? No? <laughs> okay. You're muted, Kelly. <laughs> Sorry, look, just a thank you for your time, everybody. And I um, and I look forward to reading um, the submissions that come forward um, because it's always interesting to get a variety of different perspectives on a lot of different issues and they are, they're quite meaty issues. And um, uh, I really do appreciate you giving your time to such an important cause. And again, thanking IPAN for this opportunity for, for everybody to, to have their input and say on such a critical issue. Um, moving forward. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kelly. And, and a very big thanks to Ian and to Peter. Thank you, Peter and Ian. All the best. Bye for now.